sitting here with uh, Team Bad Company talking about the Bad Company World, World Tour. Let's have a quick introduction of everybody sitting here and uh, let's talk about this. Start with you, Steve. Hey, Steve Lastly, uh, one of the captains, and uh, Anthony Shea, Kevin Bohan, David Lastly. All right. Well, these uh, these gentlemen have been traveling the world for a year, uh, chasing Trophy Blue Marlin's been the objective of the World Tour. Why don't you guys real quick give us a quick overview of what the first year or so has been like for you guys? You're on the edge here with Team Bad Company. Oh, there we go. There we go, there we go, there we go. Oh, I got it. Yeah, let's let it go. We're ready to travel the world again and not look back. Yeah, cool. Here we go, right now. Yeah! We started in June, so it's 10 months, 11, 10 months. And uh, we're starting to get into a rhythm now. I don't know about these guys, maybe they can comment, but right around Brazil, we started to hit our sort of stride a little bit. And this is, uh, you know, when we're now going through withdrawals in between trips. I, at least I am. Every day I wake up thinking about what we need to do to be prepared for the next trip. And uh, Steve tells me that's how he felt when he was commercial sword fishing. You just, you're pacing around the house, you just want to get out of here. And uh, when my kids talk to me, I don't even hear them. <laughs> I think about, I think about how I'm, I'm going to do a drop back. <laughs> yeah, full, full FOMO for yeah, sure. Yeah, but huh? right now, man, I, I tell you, I. Uh, this this world tour is starting to take on sort of a rhythm and a life, and uh, I just I just want to go back to fishing. So, um, I'll, I'll what, well, what really sucks is these people, so called friends, keep sending us all these fishing reports, and you know we're nine for fifteen today. Oh, I caught a nine fifty today. Thanks a lot, guys. Twisting the knife. <laughs> so when this thing kicked off, I know your first trip on the world tour fishing the Spencer. You had a big day to kick this thing off. Yeah, we uh, we didn't know what to expect, right? All of us, this is new to all of us as far as travel fishing, and James Robert calls it get off the porch fishing. And, uh, you know, porch fishing for us was Cabo and here and Newport Beach. By the way, we all have jackets on, <laughs> except for David, because it's still cold here in Newport this year. Uh, and then, you know, we stretched to Dakota for 18 years, but that's, and Costa Rica, but-, uh, but Panama. Panama. But you know, flying to another ocean and to another continent is all new for us. And we didn't know what to expect. Madeira was amazing. And uh, we caught five on that first day. You know, one of them uh, let go 10 feet from the from the leader or something like that. But you know, that's that's the start of it. And then what we found on the second trip is as soon as it's good, it could get not good. Because the second trip in Madeira, we didn't get a single marlin bite, right? Yep. So this world tour kicked off and I know you started in Madeira and fished some different areas. Kind of just, what are the different locations you guys hit on this on this first, kind of, I call it the 150 Spencer piece of the of the tour. So we, leg, leg one was uh, Madeira um, and the 150 came across uh, from uh, Florida. And then uh, leg two was, was Azores. And then, uh, and then we transitioned to leg three into Australia. We look forward to going back to Australia, but it probably wouldn't be for a year, maybe two, uh, just because logistically it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, and then Lake Four is when I think the addiction started, uh, which is Brazil. That was a surprise to all of us, how much fun we had fishing on a 33 foot boat, <laughs> pounding every morning for two and a half hours from 37 nautical miles to 55 nautical miles. and taking it on the nose for for that long half motocross half fishing yeah <laughs> yeah rocket man and uh, rocket man and team atville and all that stuff but that was when uh I, I tell you we didn't touch land on no, any of those trips but i think that was that that's the trip you guys can comment on how just the addiction just 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 came in right yeah you know for for me like anthony was saying i'd come back from being on the commercial fishing like 30 or 40 days straight and I'd get home and first day home and I'd start pacing like 10 o'clock in the morning and my wife would just tell me, just, just leave, just get out of here, you know? And I always had that feeling like, what am I missing out on? And then also for me, because I was so tuned into what was going on on the water, 
I felt like if I took a day off, I was starting over again and, and had to get that feeling and that vibe and that rhythm and get, get the, just the whole rhythm of what's going on with the ocean. And now I'm starting to get that feeling again. It was dead for a lot of years, but it's coming back really strong right now. And it's, I just don't want to miss out, man. And the opportunities we've been getting and how much fun we've been having, it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah, we probably should recognize OB who uh, obviously lives in Hawaii, so he couldn't he couldn't be here right now. And Dan, the the captain of the 150 and uh, the 175, and the entire 150 crew, which we are uh, you know so thankful for. They obviously are in Cape Verde right now, but this is not without us uh, appreciating all of them for sure. And talk a little bit about that crew on the 150. People probably don't realize what goes behind a sport fishing <laughs> operation like this, globe trotting. Yeah, maybe you guys can you know, talk a little bit about what you see and, and the support that you guys get. I think that Anthony says it best. They're like a, a NASCAR pick crew, man. We, they're there to support us with whatever we need. We roll in from a fishing day. They're helping us clean the boat. They're restocking us. They're refueling us. The engineer's coming over to help me fix stuff. It's a it's a full service operation that they're 100% supporting us. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. And, and Kevin, you, you kind of have a couple of different roles, obviously an outstanding world-class, you know, sport fishing captain, but it feels like a lot of like the transport moving boats from spot to spot and kind of that logistics falls on your shoulder too, huh? Yeah, I started out doing a lot of logistics. Um, we have a great team with Bobby Lee and John that are doing some of the bigger moves for us. And uh, a lot of credit goes to those guys. They're, you know, pretty much helping yeah, us shout out, out to big, both of them. Big time. For um, sure. You know, I, I handle a lot of the, the tackle stuff. Steve and I coordinate a lot of that and organize a lot of that. And then a lot of the engineering that goes on on all the different boats, we're, we're assessing and fixing stuff constantly. Yeah, I think for as hard as you guys run the boats when you're there, there's, there's a fair amount of care feeding that goes on in between trips that make sure it's ready for when Anthony shows up for the next day of fishing. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, you know, I end a trip with a list of what we need to do and what needs to get done. and to the i mean right right before i walked in here i'm sending emails and texts out to guys to try to get stuff done and getting more tackle and fixing stuff it's non-stop talk about that tackle a little bit getting <laughs> getting the tackle shop around the world that uh, that helps when the boss has a plane <laughs> <laughs> yeah air uh, air shea definitely helps us out you know we're we're sourcing teasers lures hooks um loading it up in bags and, and shipping it wherever we need to. I imagine the Wahoo been pretty good for the lure business, huh? Yeah, we've gone through some skirts. Yeah, yeah. And is the tackle different, like fishing a blue marlin in Madeira versus trying to catch them, you know, somewhere out here or something like that? Yeah, for the most part, we're, we're doing a lot of lure fishing right now. And we're, we, this past trip, we're talking about changing up a little bit, doing more pitch fishing and teaser fishing. Uh, but for the most part, we've been straight lure fishing. Okay, and then, and I know like for the lures, you pick up a blue marlin lure and, you know, in Australia, or that's a black marlin, I guess, but you know, if you're gonna fish blue marlin here on, in the Pacific or over there in the Atlantic, it's a blue marlin lure more or less. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, maybe we, different colors or something yeah, like that. Yeah, like in Brazil, we like what we call the clown color. Uh, Madeira, they seem to like the black and greens a lot. Um, you know, Cape Verde, we're finding that it was, we were told dark colors and now it seems to be brighter colors. So we're just kind of adapting with the colors and seeing how it goes. Well, I fished with Steve in his uh, suitcase full of lures before, so I don't <laughs> imagine you're running short of things to try, but the rigging, all that sort of stuff. And Steve, you mentioned something the other day about kind of a new set the hook routine that you guys are doing on the troll. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about that too much. <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, going back to what uh, Kevin was saying, you know, we, we, we have been able to work with some lure manufacturers and uh, you know they're 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 building us some custom stuff, and we're having some really good luck with that. We might put some of them if we do come up with this website. Might put some of them on there. So one of them's actually been our go-to best lure by far. And um, you know, yep, I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. And, and Dave, I'll ask you a question. You're you're kind of the the person that's documenting all this, doing the video work and stuff like that, and I'm sure a bunch of other stuff that goes into that. Yeah, what's it been like? For, for you to be part of it, watching this first with your dad and with this team and just all this stuff um yeah i don't know the whole thing's like a super you know awesome opportunity obviously um like you said it's more than just i do do the camera stuff but you know like i help you know deliver the boat with kevin from madera to the azores you know i help him watch the boat i do a lot of I, in australia me and kevin were the deckhands there so our first trip we had riley second trip it was just me and kevin on the deck so i'm like filming 
rigging baits, kind of doing everything. So I actually enjoy doing both because you get to learn a lot of stuff. Um, I also run the sonar a lot. You know, we switch off on the sonar sometimes. Brazil, second trip, when my dad wasn't there, I had to run the sonar every day. So burning my eyes out for like eight hours on the sonar while also filming everything. Drinking sriracha, watching the sun. Drinking sriracha, yeah. <laughs> Come back every night, do all the video stuff. But um, I don't know, I really like filming all of it because I do like capturing all of it. I think that definitely a couple of years from now, um, we're gonna be probably really glad that we filmed every leg of it. And we're probably gonna wish that we filmed even more really looking back. But um, it's definitely something you wanna get on video. You don't wanna miss any of, the, any of the stuff that's going on, you know? Yeah, well, you brought up a great subject there in there in that the different like uh, local captains or people that have fished those regions previously that you've kind of had right along and kind of coach up a little bit maybe on some stuff. So maybe one of you guys wants to talk about who some of that, you know, outside talent that, that's been on the boat. You mentioned some pretty massive names in the sport fishing industry. Well, we had uh, we had a few, you know, I mean, obviously, um, we're very selective on, on who we bring, not because we're being antisocial, it's just that we're in a very controlled, intense environment. And you just don't want to bring, you know, anyone that uh, that you don't, you don't mix well with. Right. But uh, for Azores, the second trip of Azores, we had James Roberts, T. Grosbeck come along. And then, uh, and then about the only guest that we have on on uh, on a consistent basis has really been just Kerry Chen. Mm -hmm. But you know these trips, you know people wonder <coughs> how intense these trips are. You know, we have a lot of fun, ton of fun to the point where we're going through withdrawals right now. But this is not fun fishing. It's not where you bring families and friends and business associates for fun fishing. Um, I mean, in Brazil, as an example, you know, we, we get up at 04, 0500, we get a bite to eat at 0600, and at 0615 or 0630, we're on that little 33 foot jet ski and we pound our brains out for two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then uh, you know, right as not even sunset, but as it gets dark, we're kissing the bumpers on the 150 on the 33, we time it to, like the last two minutes so we can run at least a little bit and, and at dusk we kiss the 150 at anchorage and that's usually 6 30 p.m yeah 6 37 even yeah yeah, yeah. 6 37 we get on you know we shower and call our families and respond to emails for about 45 minutes and then we eat dinner at 7 30. Yeah. Yeah. done with dinner at nine so that's our only one, an hour and a half of just socializing, if you will. Yeah. And then uh, in the nine o'clock, we do another 30 to 60 minutes of kind of catch up at home and then six six hours of sleep and repeat. Yeah. The so way, there's no time to do anything. The way that I look at it, and this, is, this isn't our job, this is our life and we're very passionate about it. And we take it extremely seriously, but like you said, we have a lot of fun with it, but it's it's pretty much next level stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really short runway, any way you look at it, whether it lasts two years, three years, four years, whatever it is, it's the runway is X amount of distance, right. man. And we're on a big old plane and we're, we're I, I wanna take up every inch of that runway. I'm getting old too, man, I'm 66, you know? And, and so this opportunity that Anthony's given me to finish my career on such a strong note and really apply everything that I've learned over, sheesh, I hate to say it, 50 years of fishing, man. I'm, getting to put it all together. I get to do it with Kevin, one of my best friends. I get to do it with David, my son. I get to do it with Anthony, who's become one of my mentors, one of my few mentors and one of my best friends. And I don't want to waste a minute, man. I it, it, I, I, don't know. I, I'd like to be there right now, to be honest. Sure. I imagine at the end of the trip, you're tired and you're ready to come home, but the next day you're ready to go back. That's about how long it takes, about one day. I get one one good night's sleep and then my grandkids get me sick or something and I'm flat on my back for a few days. But man, even then I'm ready to go, you know? Sure. So Steve, part of your, you know, obviously you're the sport fishing captain, fished, you know, all over the West Coast here in Pacific, putting the puzzle together on a piece of water you haven't fished yet. How much brain damage does that do for you? Uh, it's a challenge, huh? But we've been able to shrink the ocean down pretty good. I think every spot we've gone to, 
we always pick one or two spots in each region and call them alpha. That's where we figure out is going to be our best chance to see a really big fish. Very, very close, you know, to a very small, very small piece of real estate. And we've been able to find alpha pretty good, I think, uh, on, on most every trip. Not this one, though. Okay, well, okay, I was right. it's pretty challenging. <laughs> I, was just I always like to mess with this guy. When I asked him a question 13, 14 years ago, if he had to pick one between gyro binoculars or Omni, which one would he pick? He still won't answer it 13 years later. I can't. It's so, impossible so, to answer. So, 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 so sir, <laughs> where's Alpha and K Verde? Why don't you uh, let our wonderful followers know what Alpha means in your head in different locations and where Alpha is in Cape Verde. <clears throat> there's, there's Beta as much as Alpha in Cape yeah, Verde. Yeah, I know there, man. There's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot so far in Cape Verde. And may maybe by the end of the trip, we'll have it figured out, but I don't think so. I, th I think it's, in this instance, I would pick the Omni Sonar. Then it's where the Omni so Sonar tells us to slow down and how long to slow down for. So K Verde has 10 islands. Some people say nine, some people say 10. And we don't know anything about the area. So just, just uh, uh, we don't pretend to, to know at all. But based on what we see after two weeks of fishing there every day, just when you think that one area sets up, it breaks down. The only constant is change. Yeah, so it's kind of like the old saying in weather in Texas, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the same thing with Cape Verde. If you like something or don't like something, just wait 15 minutes and something's going to change. Yeah, one, one of the strangest things about Cape Verde, which I can't figure out, I can't wrap my head around, is whale sharks or filter feeders are normally where there's green, nutrient-rich water. That place is corroded with whale sharks and the blue marlin are right where the whale sharks are. And I've been told by a lot of the locals, if you're not seeing the whale sharks, not gonna be any blue marlin. So that adds an extra level of excitement since most of them are just far enough below the surface that you don't see them. And then, so then we backed off and we thought, okay, well, we'll find them on the sonar. Nope. <laughs> backed away with the sonar and I looked at that thing and it was about the size of a pinhead and how a 35 foot or a 30 foot creature can shrink down to the size of a pinhead repeatedly on every single shot, no matter what I did, beats me. Wow. Learn something new every day. Never done learning. One of the things you guys have talked about a lot in the Atlantic, which might be a little different than uh, the Pacific, is the currents and water temperature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you, be, behind me, you know. These, these docks here, uh, depending on the moon cycle, will move 15 feet every 24 hours, right? It comes up and goes down, and that's how the Pacific keeps itself, you know, going here. Uh, the, the Atlantic, you know, depending on where you are in the Atlantic, the tide doesn't move as much, and that Gulf Stream just constantly screaming. We were, what, the Azores? When, when, when we were trolling around, all of a sudden, it was, it was grease, it was flat calm but you can just see the water like a jacuzzi moving way offshore. I mean, we were probably eight, nine miles offshore and it's just, it's just looking like a whirlpool out there. Yeah, swirling, eddying, looked more like a river around a sharp bend or it's something. Crazy I, looking. I've yeah. never seen anything yeah. like it. It was unnerving it was moving so much, huh? I mean, obviously you never see things like that in the Pacific and who knows what Indians like, right? Indian doesn't have a Northern influence, right? because the, the upper edge of the Indian is actually latitude 22, which is about the same as Cabo San Lucas. Can, mm -hmm. you, you can just imagine if the water starts at Cabo going down. So India would be interesting. You know, I've never fished there, so I'm looking forward to, to, to doing that. But so far, Atlantic is very, very different. And by the way, if, if we want to talk about fish behavior, and again, we only have 30 days in each particular region, so we're not experts about it. But what we see in the 30 to 40 days that we fish, these fish not only look different, but they behave completely different. They just, they're, and, and they're completely different from, from, from Pacific creatures. They're, you know, the, we're catching fish in 67 degree water. Yep, 67, 68 degree water. We would, I wouldn't even slow down. I would, you would hardly ever find stripers. I mean, you do catch a lot of stripers and that, don't get me wrong, but that's not like the optimum right. that you're looking for. And these guys are telling us if it gets much over 75, it's over. I'm, Typically, we don't even start looking for them until it's 77, you know? So that Atlantic blue marlin versus Pacific, it's a different critter. Yeah. Out in colder water. 
I mean, we're certainly not scientists, but they nope. look different. It could be just the environment that, that they're in. The colors are different. <laughs> the, the body shapes are different. Uh, but, you know, you know, certainly uh, the, the Brazil fish are a lot more acrobatic. Um, you know, they, they do a lot more speed runs, a lot more directional changes, just, just, just psychotic behavior. I mean, just, they're just crazy. It's the Brazil fish, you just don't know what you're going to get. And the Cape Verde fish are just, they're, they're mean. mean. Then you got, <laughs> then mean. you got Devil Island. Yeah, and then, and then they're so mean, our, our leader man, OB, calls Cape Verde Devil Island. <laughs> <laughs> possessed. And they're just possessed. I mean, they're, they're just, they're mean. They're, they're mean fish. I mean, that, we're not taking any credit away from any other zone. A blue Marlin is a blue Marlin. They're, they're always, you know, tough creatures, but it just seems like the Cape Verde fish are just mean. So but there's there's one really good story about that. So OB bless his heart, man. I mean, he's he he is he, we, we get him pretty quick and he's he's taken a pretty good shellac and he's got bandages and stuff all over his knees and his hands are kind of torn up and and uh we get one that's not doing much and we back up to the thing and he's going like this slack leader <laughs> trying to get it to move because he knows it's going to come alive you know and turn him inside out and he's doing anything he can i, I haven't seen anything like that in my <laughs> lifetime he completely slack line going come Go on man i know slack. you got it in you yeah he's like oh <coughs> please wake up i don't want you to stretch me <laughs> boy it's got to be nice having him on the leader huh oh yeah he's super smooth he's the man, man. He's super, super smooth, and uh, but I'll tell you, he's got a he's got a whole new respect for these Cape Verde fish because there's there's not much consistency on the pole. They can just they can just turn on like a light switch any 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 moment. So the way these fish are fighting and looking are different. What about the way they come up behind the boat? Is that pretty standard blue marlin stuff, or they feel different there too? They're all different. They're all different. That's what, what's 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 interesting based on what we're seeing so far from Pacific and, and Northern and Southern uh, Atlantic. These fish behave completely different uh, behind the boat. So, you know, a lot of guys message us, hey, why don't you pitch? You know, there's some areas the fish, you know, you don't have a, you don't have an opportunity to pitch. You Brazil gotta, was a lot of crash bites. Yeah, you got you got to get them when they're crash biting. And, uh, and then you got Cape Verde where the fish are a lot more committed. I think Azores are some opportunity to, to, pitch, to, yeah. to pitch because they're a lot more committed, but a lot of them, they just come up and flash and they try to kill the, 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 the bait and then they leave. So it's just one, one pass and that's that, huh? Well, and a, another thing that for me personally, the driving factor is I've heard so many stories from really good qualified captains like Olaf and, and you know, guys like that, that had a really giant fish come into the spread and be on the teaser and not switch off of the teaser and we had the same thing happen to us in hawaii um, i've had it happen a number of times in my career and i would just be really upset if we were in this super foreign region traveling the way we were traveling and putting all this effort into it and we did see the right the right one and we couldn't get it to switch off of whatever to eat the bait I, Man, that's something that you know you wouldn't forget for a bad reason. Right. So uh, that's that was really one of our driving factors, and it's the same thing with the tackle that we're using with Anthony. It's yeah, man, it's a little bit on the heavy side, and uh, but if we get that one opportunity, I want it to go for a boat ride. You know, I right. I, I don't I don't want to be talking about that giant one that we had a shot at, and you know went straight down and died, and you know something happened or. We couldn't get it to switch off and you know the thing was as big as a bus i want to i want to catch it so what's what is the one fish what what's the marker for that you know i mean like steve said you know there's an ending to this and you know hopefully it's not for a couple of years or hopefully you know a little longer i think that you know i think it'd be foolish for us to you know call out any particular number or you know how many you know, we're going to fish the best of our abilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when that lifetime fish comes up, if it comes up, we just want to be in the position to maximize our chances of catching that fish. And sorry, Green Peas, but we're going to kill it. Yeah. Yep. We're going to kill it. Gonna wait, I think, yeah. And uh, and if that day comes, great. If it doesn't come, then we just want to go out and just uh, be focused and intense about it. And just maximize our chances as much as we possibly can. If we have, if we get a lifetime fish where 
you know, when I'm hopefully when I make it 85 years old, I can talk to my great great grandchildren about Grace. If not, I'll talk to them about the world tour. So this this world tour is all about trophy blue marlin fishing. That's that's the name of the game. You're not here for catching this, the most blue marlin. You want to catch the big ones. That's the objective. <clears throat> you know what's what's interesting? Rod knows all of us for for, for a lifetime. Um, for a lot of the recent followers, they think that we're just you know only bred for blue, big blue marlin. And what what you know people don't have a chance to get to know us as we as as we grow up. But you know I I used to go to fish on the pier right for you know mackerel every single day growing up and then uh working on sport boats and all of us uh, just have fishing in 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 our in, in in our in our genetics so fishing is fishing the difference is we're lucky because we have the the resources to go after what we believe is the trophy of the ocean which is a trophy blue marlin black marlin surface stories and uh it's not just the funding. A lot of people, oh, if I win the lottery, I'd do this too. You gotta have the time, right? You gotta be able to manage it. You're gonna have to keep the team together, the logistics, the travel, being away from family, and you know, putting all that together. We just want to be able to go as, as long as we can and, and maximize it. So you brought up <clears throat> surface swordfish, which I think you guys have seen a few, but really haven't uh, put made that the number one priority yet, huh? No, not yet. No, but we did see like schools, maybe like six or eight of them in Brazil, three of them together, twice, two different times. I got them on video one time. If you look close, I think you can see three at one point, which is pretty cool. Yeah, there, there was actually more than that. When you're on the up in the tower looking down in, you could, there, I was seeing quite a few. It was really funny. <clears throat> I mean, we've been fishing how many hundred days now, 80 days now, or something, and you ever heard me yell like that before? I think he's serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was I was up in the tower by myself, and I think Kevin was driving down below, and I said I got a swordfish, and then I said oh, I got no, a swordfish. No, you didn't it. say. You screamed it. <laughs> it. And the second or third time, David goes, I think he's serious. <laughs> so that was good fun. I mean, but every, they were giant. Yeah, every location has been pretty amazing, right? So it's uh we we try to we try to represent that to to to, to everyone that, that cares to, to to follow along and you know we made an investment into to making sure that we portray sport fishing and to promote the sport promote um travel fishing big fishing management of boats and all that so that we can inspire the community and inspire those that that live vicariously through through us but Every location has been unique in, in the charm that it, in, in the logistics that it, it creates. But I got to tell you, I mean, Cape Verde is incredible and Azores is incredible, but there's something about that Brazil. I can't, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something about that Brazil that just captures you. And we're going to go back, man. And we're, 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 we're going to go magical back. magical place. It's pretty magical. We're you know what was back. fun too was those fads we found this last trip, those two fads. That was, that was kind of cool. And all the wahoo we're going to be rigged up a little bit more to do a little bit more of the surface casting at those but without taking too much time out of our our deal but yeah i, I imagine just you know going to new places seeing new things and one of the things that i've enjoyed watching is in some of these locations you kind of hosted a cocktail party for the community each time and, and got them involved i think that's super cool and it gives you some of the flavor local flavor and again helps them appreciate you know team bad company coming to their backyard yeah, it's it's been nice, you know. It's, we we just we just always want to, you know, appreciate the local community and 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 for everyone to understand that we never forget that we're the visitors, and yeah. that uh, you know we always want to be respectful to the local community and to the local uh, professional captains and charter captains, who's been enormously uh, supportive and open to to us coming in. Yeah, we've met a lot of great people, a lot of great charter captains in each location. Yeah, I imagine they're excited to see you come in and probably not too disappointed when you guys <laughs> get out of there looking to get back to their business. But um, looks like some other uh, traveling yachts and stuff in some of those locations as well, but nothing like a program like you have. You know, we, <clears throat> we you know, we're making adjustments as we go. Uh, we're making, you know, a few mistakes here and there. 
uh, and we just got to continue to adjust because no one has a playbook for this. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, just this morning, we uh, we made a decision to uh, to sell the the one fifty, and uh, you know I thought I was going to live with that boat for years and years and years. Um, but what we're figuring out is, you know, fishing 13, 14 days plus two to three days of traveling and then having 20 to 25 days off, there's just no time to, to do two motherships. Right. Um, and uh, the 175 is going to be so nice that, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't think that we'll be able to reasonably have a need for the 150. So, um, so someone is going to end up with a... Uh, a nice vessel and then uh you know in the meantime the delta behind us the 92 that's going to be done hopefully in a few months and then the 144 that's sitting in uh, florida they're just uh they're on the bullpen right they're not really going to see any game time not any serious game time until you know we slow down this 120 days of travel fishing a year and then hopefully that goes on for another one two three years however long we can keep going Right, so that 150 was a boat that existed that you bought for this. At the same time, you commissioned a 175, purpose built for exactly for Anthony Shea in, in the Bad Company World Tour. So tell everybody what's, what that boat's going to do that the 150 does. <clears throat> well, the 175 is just a much, much gr bigger and more capable and more luxurious uh, and a more modern version. Domin uh, Yachts is uh, building a 175. The 150 is also a Domin. The 150 is the last haul of the last generation. And the 175, which is a 53 meter, is the first haul of the new generation. So some of the highlights of the 175, timing wise, we're actually going to interrupt our next Cape Verde trip, and fly to Turkey and witness the splash of that boat. Um, that would be uh, late May. <clears throat> And then uh, she will be done, hopefully, with the keys handed over to us around mid-August. Uh, she will carry uh, the 43 release, mm -hmm. which right now, you know, we're still working on the timing of that because we've had um, some work that needs to be done on the release. is now back in the, the factory in, in New Jersey, right? Is that, is that where it is? Correct. And then uh, the Blackfin you know, continues to make steady progress, but it won't be done in time. So we're gonna move the 33 LNH okay. to the 175. Uh, we built a custom hanger. Uh, so it'll house the, the Bell 505 chopper, uh, along with, uh, we're building uh, aviation fuel uh, support. I can't remember how many gallons we're gonna, we're gonna carry, but uh, so I have that and uh, you know, all the appropriate toys, such as jet skis and inflatables and, and all that. Um, and then they'll hold 42,000 gallons of fuel. 42,000. It's, uh, it's, it's unbelievably fast. It has a top speed of 20 knots. It sounds like a small boat, but it's actually a 175 footer. You know, cruise all day long at 15 knots. So that just means that we're able to make uh, you know, 300 nautical miles a day when we're on the move. Does having that helicopter open up some territory that you can't hit today? Well, the difference with the helicopter is that we can uh, we can position the boat, um, you know, up to 200 nautical miles away is this is the safety margin so that uh, whatever airport uh, we land in, uh, the boats don't have to come pick us up. We right. go to the boat 200 miles up to 200 miles away. And then that saves travel time on both ends of the trip, right? You wrap it up where you wrap it up. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I wish it was helpful for ascensions, but it's not. <laughs> right. So, so only way you can buy time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's really what it boils down to is, is just time on the water. And it seems like you're going somewhere for 30 days, 20 days. It seems like a long time, but I imagine that burns really, really fast when you're when you're fishing every day. Yeah, so far, you know, so far what we figured out is, you know, 13 or 14 days of actual fishing, weather permitting, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, most of our trips have been cut short because of weather, some sort of wind or storm or, or, or whatever. But uh, you also have to allow another two to four days of travel to and from. And then in the case of Ascensions, uh, that airport is closed on Ascensions. Um, so the only way to get there is to fly into St. Helena and then the boats have to be in St. Helena for us to get off the, the plane, get on the, 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 in this case, it would be the 175, and you got to haul tail for 720 nautical miles until you get to Ascension. So between flying there and then, you know, 
getting there 720 nautical miles. That's like burning rubber from here, Southern California to Cabo, right? So it's a long ways. So you're looking at back and forth, 10 days of travel time. Yeah, so that that cuts into it. Uh, that's that's the part that people don't really probably hard to get a, a grasp on. So <clears throat> out of all of this, you know, what do you probably caught? Over a hundred fish, I'd imagine by now, huh? I haven't added up the whole we thing, but like fifty four or fifty six <clears throat> just for this year. We have fifty fifty something for this calendar year. Uh huh. And I, I don't know what we had last year since the beginning of the world too. I would imagine another forty or fifty, including Australia. So yeah, we've like already <clears throat> caught more this year than we caught. So sure. you got around a hundred fish. If, if you were to talk about one fish that, that sticks out out of all of those, is there one for whether it's the bite, the catch, got away, was bigger than the rest? First one in the Azores. The first fish we caught in the Azores. Steve, me, Steve will disagree. The second fish we caught in the Azores. The, fir the first <laughs> and second fish in the Azores were, were really big. Um, Steve will probably chime in on that. That stick, sticks out in his mind, I know that. Uh, the first or second fish, I, I don't know, they were both pretty big. So you always hate to, at the start of something, just whack the first one that comes in. You know, we're still trying to gauge everything. They look a, a, a lot different based on what size boat you're on, how much beam it has, yada, yada, yada. I thought the first one was really long and really skinny. And the second one for me was the, uh, the Azores fish was the only one that I ever said, get the gaffs out. And it did shorten up quite a bit when I was alongside the boat, but it was, it really was just giant big around. All the pictures show that. And we were gonna get it up alongside the boat and get a better look at it. And the hook straightened out on the leader. So we didn't get that opportunity to really get a, a, a great look at that one. And then Kevin's trip, they, they saw a couple really big ones that, that got away. The first Brazil trip that I was on, I thought we saw a really big one that got away. I mean, there's this last Cape Verde trip. We, we just had bad luck with one, but- uh, Sounds like a fish story, all the big ones get away. Man, but it, it's pretty- <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> gonna break that up. it's pretty exciting. I, I gotta say, it's the most exciting, I'm- Yeah, I'm First, first you gotta up. get them on. You can't catch them if you can't get them on. I'm wound up about the whole thing, man. Yeah, yeah. For me personally, just seeing those big ones just gets my blood going. Is it, yep. it is addicting and I'm not saying that to everybody that's watching this like you know we're rubbing it in people's face because not everybody have an opportunity to witness it but I hope all of you can sense the energy from from the team seeing one of these perfectly proportioned big round huge animal pissed it pissed off <laughs> <Yeah>, not happy <laughs> and it is it is it's terrible it is just absolutely addicting blue marlin is fun but seeing a seven eight nine hundred pounder yeah that's that's something special and to see it reasonably you guys talked about a half a dozen of them so that tells you that it's been a it's been a fun year what about you david which fish sticks out for you well i think that the first one we caught was the biggest which i just look at all the videos because i have videos of all of them so that it's like, like a lasley <laughs> yeah, yeah. watching the videos sizing it from them his that mom. Way. i would say i honestly think the first fish that we caught in in Azores was probably close to foot and a half, two foot longer than the nine ten that we caught. So it was like colossal. It was giant when it came up on the leader. There's a shot from the bridge above with OB on the leader. Yeah, it was the big. thing is like so long, giant. Big belly hump. rolls all over. It has a hump on its head where the dorsal fin comes up. It's like this high. It doesn't even look right. Like it's this weird hump coming on its head because it's just like a dinosaur sized fish. And then probably the coolest, the other one that sticks out is the, the, the 910 bridge. that came jumping out of the water. Um, yeah, the one, the one that like, has like, like 10 million video. views already. Yeah, yeah that, that one's that. like the coolest video ever. The thing just comes rocketing out of the water. It made one big jump early on and then it just swam it down sea and I was able to put the boat right as it was going by us. Yeah, we touched the leader in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, o OB almost got a shot at it in about <laughs> We're all looking at each other. Two minutes. Like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> touched the leader and it wound up, realized it was hooked and the thing went ballistic. Yeah. That, awesome. that one that jetted off in front of us in Brazil was a nice one, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That thing bit. We hooked a nine in Brazil. It and it like raced in front of us within a in second. Front of our boat. You couldn't even see it. There's like the GoPro, you can kind of just see the splashes and we're trying to- no, that, that's, that's the fish that, that I think about the most. Yeah, that was, that was a good one. That was trip to Brazil. This thing 
was just possessed. We were, you know, trolling in to have knots, and this thing was, I'm, I'm fixing the back of the boat, this thing bites, the drag starts, stops going out, and the next thing I know, it comes out full Greyhound. She must have been going 30 miles an hour, so at fast. least, Yeah. right? Yeah. She came out of the water right around the first wake, and by the time she landed, she was already beyond the wheel. I think probably jumped like 25 foot. Th that's what I mean. Was she like, was, she jumped so far. It was just this. You can see the this, holes. It's like super spread Yeah, out. and it was a, a it was like 50 perfectly yards in proportioned, the spun out. perfectly proportioned, beautiful fish. Yeah, it's a giant. It's it was long and uh, and then we fought it for the whole, whole way. So it was up and down 30 feet from the leader and Hope just decided to come out. Splashing out far, is that the same yeah. fish? That's the one that you got You can see jumping its out. out and its tail's coming yeah. out like yeah. 10, 10, 12 feet behind it, its head's out. That was a real out. one. Bending like that. That so was a giant. real one. That was a real one. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> hooks are meant to penetrate and sometimes they don't. Right. So, come on, button. So one of the things that's been impressive, like just kind of you know paying attention and watching all this stuff, is you're catching a lot of these really good sized fish, seven, eight, nine hundred pound plus, we'll call it. You're not on these fish for three, four hours. You're, you, you're, you guys, your team is able with the angler and the boat driving and OB to get on these fish and you get on them. Um, <clears throat> so I think we've only had two fish over thirty minutes, and one was because it died, and we had to had to had to plane it up. Mm -hmm. I think I think two fish or something like that. That's about right. But. Um, <clears throat> You know, both Steve and Kevin, they don't they don't come back like a hot dog. You know, they don't they don't go racing back and then I'm retreating the line. I mean, we we just always want to have tension on the fish, um, regardless of what direction the, the boat is going, and um, you know, steady pressure, just just you know, angling one on one, right? But just, just steady pressure, and you know, we're uh, it just it just works that way. I mean, we don't we don't hook a fish and say, well, geez, let's try to get it you know, as fast as possible. That's not our objective. No, just fight the fish the way that we fight the fish. But I think you're putting plenty of pressure on, right? Oh yeah, he's got some heat on those things, man. <laughs> I mean, and you know, the other thing is the quicker you catch them and the sooner you let them go, the better shape that they're typically in, you know, unless they get all balled up in it somehow, you know, and then there's nothing you can do about that. But and we got more time to get another one. Right. You got, yeah. you, know, you, got, you got to trust your gear. I mean, whether you're fishing eight pound for bass, 20 pound for tuna or, you know, whatever it is, you got to know the limitation of your gear and you have to maximize the leverage of it. And uh, and that's no different than than, than heavy gear. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing, what, the, what I noticed is, you know, and some of you know that we have the exact same chair on all five of our game boats so that I, I have a muscle memory on the angles and the distances of, of my rev limit chair. But you all that you've thrown out the window fishing in that 33 LNH and rough seas. When you're rough seas, then when that boat pitches back or forward to side to side, those angles are history. <laughs> so for the first time, these guys see me grabbing onto the chair because it feels like it's going to launch me like, you know, like a scud missile because as soon as the angle changes slightly, I lose my leverage. So you got, you just gotta, you gotta hang on. I mean, fishing the Spencer in calm waters off of Azores, you know, that angle doesn't change. But in the LNH, man, when you got four to foot, four to six foot seas and you're pitching side to side. It's bucking you. That's bucking me, yeah. Yeah, same thing when you're in the tower trying to drive. I mean, you'll be leaning back, pushing back as hard as you can against the backrest. And you hit a wave and it will literally throw you over the dash where you're hanging on, like over the top of the thing. Happened a number of times. But fishing on that little boat was fun. Super do I want to do it again? No. <laughs> but was that fun? Yeah, that was that high was energy. That was so much fun, man. So much fun. Yep. Yeah. That's a whole different experience. You got your 92, your 75, your 144, your 60, your 57, and then you get on a on a 33 in what Steve described as washing machine conditions of swells coming from three different directions. Oh, some Steve, current on it. Steve, exactly. hit, Steve hit the, he hit one swell and it seemed like we had a 10 second hang time. Got so quiet. Yeah. And guys, it just went up in the air and all of us just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Complete one, it, you'd think the motors would go or some weird phenomena, but it was just like Kevin said. Dead silent. Silence. Dead silence. <laughs> Until we landed. Until, Until we landed. Quack, quack. <laughs>
He's not the auto so put, put some wear and tear on that rig, but she held up, huh? She did yeah. great. She did great. She's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exciting. So you got a trip coming up here in a couple of weeks. Is that the, the next deal? Yeah, so a little bit about uh, the rest of the year. Uh, the uh, We have we have uh, trip two and trip three in Cape Verde. Uh, trip three will uh, involve the, the World Cup on, on 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then John and, and uh, Bobby Lee is gonna move the Spencer uh, to Azores unless Madeira is biting. Um, and then um, right, right in between that, I'm gonna take delivery of the 175 and uh, put some time on her in the Mediterranean and making sure that uh, we shake all the you know, new bugs out of it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the next year we're gonna keep the 175 in the Atlantic again, okay. most likely, it's all subject to change, but uh, assuming the 43 release will be on board and uh, 33 LNH is on board, uh, we're gonna send everything south end of this year and uh, hopefully do a, either a Ascension trip in November or December. Um, but uh, we will be November to March between Brazil and Ascension. And we're trying to get a permit right now to fish, not the- Trin Trinidad? Tr Tr Trinidad. Trinidad. Trinidad, not Trinidad, Trinidad, which is 600 miles off the coast. It's an island that is occupied by the Bra Brazilian military, 600 miles uh, off the coast of Brazil. It's a whole chain if you look on the map. Mm. But we're trying to get a permit to anchor there. Okay. So we want to fish Ascensions and we want to fish Trinidad and then uh, and then go back up to North Atlantic and Cape Verde by April again. And then the following year, 2025, we're going to go through the Mediterranean, drop down the Suez Canal and spend the year in the, in the Indian. Okay, so that's, that's pretty exciting. So one more Atlantic season and then transition as it stands today to, to the Pacific and Indian Ocean. You know what's gonna happen, <laughs> we talked about this, is we're gonna get to the Indian. We're gonna be looking at all these beautiful water and beautiful white sand beaches and having the time of our life and it's snapping at Cape Verde or snapping at Azores and it's, it's gonna drive us crazy. But the good news is we'll the Spencer will be there. Right. So we can just go fish on the Spencer and Cape Verde, it's nice to have a mothership, but you don't have to have one. Azores and Madeira, you definitely don't need a mothership because there's plenty of resorts and stuff there. So for those of us that don't quite get the geography, Azores, Madeira, Cape Verde, how far are those from each other? What did we say? Madeira and... and Madeira, and uh, Madeira to the Azores is like 600. Yeah, it's about 600. And then coming down, it was from... Canaries. You got the Canaries, which is another 380 mm -hmm. to the Canaries, and then from there down it was like six high sixes, 680. Yeah, right at seven. Yeah. So it's basically Cape Verde, Canaries. Canaries is where we store the boat when we're not fishing it. Gets a lot of maintenance there. John lives there and takes care of the boat for us. Then Madeira, and then up from there is, is the Azores. The Azores cut out. Which more I, towards the middle of the ocean. Should be better in geography in high school. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Madness. But it uh, sounds like it's pretty exciting to go <clears throat> fish these world-class areas in the Atlantic. Growing up here on the West Coast, it's stuff we've heard about, didn't really know much about. So it's, it's super exciting you guys are there. Guys I know are down there doing it and catching these fish and learning it, learning the culture, learning the people, and getting the experience. It, it, it sounds awesome. With, with all the constantly changing locations, what we have to do is do a little bit of research in a ton of areas, and then as things get close and we hone in on it, then we put a ton of focus into that area trying to figure it out, because if you put a ton of focus into everything, you would never get anything right. done. Right, spread out. <laughs> and I do, <clears throat> I just want to comment on, on our website, and you know, you guys, I, I get four to 15 messages a day asking about, you know, do you sell shirts or when the website's ready? Um, you know, we, we, we absolutely want, want to do that. Uh, just ask for everybody's patience. This, this is, uh, our goal is to chase our, our collective dreams. And I know my role and everybody understands their respective roles. We're, 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 we're not a business. So, uh, but at the same time, we want to promote the community. We want to promote the sport. We want to inspire uh, the next generation. You know, there might be a 25 year old out there right now that is a, you know, and by the time he gets, uh, he's 45 or 50, he wants to do this, but just, you know, at a totally different level. By that time, they'll probably be, you know, rockets. <laughs> you can get the Madeira an hour and a half. I mean, 
who knows, right? So uh, we just want to be good for the community, good for the sport, and you know we'll be pushing out that 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 website soon, and it's going to give you a lot more updates, and it allows us to be a lot more interactive. I try to be as interactive as, as I can now, and uh, um, but uh, anyways, I just want to ask for everybody's patience, and then when we do sell the merchandise. Uh, a lot of the proceeds will go to uh, War Heroes on Water, which is something that uh, <clears throat> all of us have, have been with from, from the very beginning. But we started uh, a nonprofit uh, for healing of our uh, uh, War Heroes. Uh, Woody is now on our team as uh, head of security. Uh, he's one of the founding um, um, vets of, of, of that that started seven years ago. So Rob, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, about that. Sure, I'd be delighted. So Warriors on Water, if you're not familiar with it, it, it's a charity fishing tournament hosting and benefiting combat wounded veterans. And uh, we're, each year now we're hosting about 125 veterans. We're inviting them here to Newport Beach. We kick the tournament off right where we're sitting right here on the dock. We have uh, 50 sport fishing yachts that all volunteer, donate their time, their money, their crew. These guys have all been on every single year. Uh, we take these vets fishing, we load them up here. We fish three days off here in Southern California. Marlin, Tuna, Dorado, bottom fish, whatever. Show them a great time. It's a charity, we, it's a nonprofit. We raised over $5 million so far uh, to, to support these combat wounded veterans. And more important that we build bonds and relationships with these guys because we, we we know how much they, they, they need that community and, and we're part of it. So super proud to operate that fishing tournament. I've been very blessed to kind of be part of this, helping out with Team Bad Company, get the word out. You guys have been gracious. I've done a number of seminars and things where you're really open in the playbook and, and letting the world know, you know, here's what we do, here's how we do it. We want everybody, we're not here to hide our fishing. We're here to share it with the world and encourage it. And as you say, Anthony, put sport fishing in a good light. So it, it's, it's been great to be part of that watch the, the, the kind of the evolution of Team Bad Companies to watch you guys out there fishing and watching Web and trying to figure out what's going on and got a chance to hang out with you guys, fish a little bit. Steve will let me talk about it, two thirds of it. <laughs> and then about a month later, we can we can say some other stuff, but it's been great for the sport. It's been great for the community. We did a little summer at Yacht Club a couple of days ago and they, they had a packed house there. Everyone wants to hear what Steve Lousy has got to say. Everyone wants to know what Anthony, Kevin, and Dave, all you guys, your experiences so it's been wonderful for me to just kind of tag along and every once in a while get to reel one in but uh it's been fun but as modern technology has evolved as you've been able to travel the world in a jet and got a mothership with a crane that can launch all this stuff so that some of these other traveling things just didn't have that technology there's one piece of technology that everybody wants to know about the new thing and that's that omni sonar <laughs> well should we take a break because that's gonna be a long discussion